Hey, good morning. Uh, it's great to be here speaking to you today. Uh, a couple of days ago, we were around the meal table and uh, chatting as a family. I was explaining to my son that I'm preaching on Sunday morning, and uh, he said to me, oh, is it going to be one of those the meaning of Christmas talks? where you remind us all of the real meaning of Christmas again. Uh, and in that moment, all of my thoughts and prayers sort of shriveled into a, well, yes, uh, I was hoping it would be a little bit more compelling than that. Because today I do want to invite you uh, to take another look at one particular part of that first Christmas story. Uh, I want to that bit in the Christmas story where Gabriel announces the birth to Mary. These days, you see, we like our stories pretty fast-paced. We want them to move us, whether that's laughing or crying, whether it's excited or scared. Uh, and then we want to move on from them, frankly, uh, to the next one as quickly as possible. And I recognize, uh, as maybe my son did, we could all move on too easily from the Christmas story without the reality of those first remarkable, historic events uh, really impacting us, without understanding all that they were and all that they are to us still. And in a moment, I'm going to read from the Bible, from Luke's account. Luke, who would have personally known Mary and heard her account of these things, uh, that first Christmas. But I think making sense of his account of it requires some appreciation of how it was written, uh, how Luke wrote stuff, and how he thought about it. You see, Luke was from a time when stories were not tall tales for a moment, but they were defining truths for a lifetime. Your story said who you were and what you'd come to believe of life and the world and everything. Stories defined you. And it seems as Luke is thinking about who he is and who any of us are, he's got some really big questions in mind. Who was Jesus? I mean, really, who was he? What does responding to Jesus mean? What might it actually be like? What could we expect as Jesus followers? And so here's what he says at the beginning of his book, named after himself. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who has been called barren. 
for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And then we hear that Mary visited her cousin. And we rejoin Luke's account in verse 45 as Elizabeth is saying this to Mary. And blessed be she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken through the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has looked on his humble, on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Those were awesome days, as we read of them in the book of Luke. And before anything else, Luke is telling us, he's telling us something about Jesus. In the words of the angel, as we have it in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, he will be great. Extraordinary. Not long before, you see, Luke had told about the announcement of another unexpected birth there was this guy Zachariah he was what you might call a a premier league priest one with all the right credentials he was out there doing the priest stuff in fact it was out there when he was doing the priest stuff that he heard about it all and he and his highly respectable wife Elizabeth were to receive baby John that would be in answer to all of their prayers John, they were told, would be great before the Lord. There was absolutely no other term in their vocabulary for greatness. You could be great before Steve Cornford and that wouldn't be all that impressive. You could be great before some other president or ruler, you know, maybe before Caesar, and that that might be a little bit more impressive. John would be great before. Before the Lord. Great, right, a greatness that reached to heaven. There was no greater term for greatness. You couldn't be greater than that because only God is truly great. How else could they describe greatness? Except get this. This is what Luke is trying to impress on us. The angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you're going to have baby Jesus and he will be called great yeah right yeah great what sort of great what great before who he will be called great what what utterly great no one's utterly what just just great no one is that great No wonder Mary is saying, how will this be? How can I be that close to God? You you just told me I'm going to have a baby that's going to be great. How will this be, Mary asks. In fact, um. I've got a sneaky feeling she might have been thinking, how could I be that close to God and still live? God, who is, well, how else could you say it? He's great. And in short, Mary's told, because nothing is impossible for God. I wonder how much life since then people have frittered Uh, insisting, no, it really was impossible for God. She couldn't have been a virgin. Oh, come on. 
who could actually have the final authority that is only possible for God? Well, maybe God. This Christmas, we remember Jesus. He will be great. Because nothing is impossible for God. And in order for us to try and think about that a little bit more, (laughs) think about what this all means, I want us to think about some of the responses that Mary made to that kind of announcement of God's greatness. That kind of announcement of God's greatness that close to Mary. That up close and personal in her life. What did Mary respond? How is she thinking about that truth? That was clearly going to make a lasting difference on her, in her. What about us? Well, the first thing we see is uh, in verse 29. uh, It's discerning. She was greeted, right, Uh, by an angel. Yep. (laughs) As a favored one. Really? Wow. As someone the Lord is with. Now, I get it might seem to us that being greeted by an angel is the most shocking thing. And I'm going to assume that even for Mary, that hadn't happened before. But if Mary didn't want to be discerning, perhaps all she would have said was, no way, I wasn't expecting an angel today. But that isn't her response, is it? She wanted to discern not just, uh, are you really an angel? Or, you know, why are you visiting me? She wanted to understand the greeting what sort of greeting it might be. So I think we probably need to think about that to understand something of the meaning. You see, we're told by Luke that she is a virgin betrothed to a man. That's an important detail. Luke only puts important details in. In other words, Mary was preparing to marry, which most commonly happened just after you became an adult at, in those days, 13 years old. In other words, she was probably just the other side of 12. She was very young at a time when that wasn't considered to be cool or full of possibility and potential in the way that we often view youth today. Right then, young meant something a little bit more like naive, inexperienced and unqualified. Sorry about that, Uh, any 13-year-olds in the room. uh, It's a different world now. But that's what people would have thought. What? Someone 13, 12? In other words, and Luke is trying to sit these two together. She was the polar opposite of Elizabeth and Zachariah. These soon-to-be parents of baby John. And maybe Luke is making a deliberate contrast here. Because... Yeah, they were experienced, they were qualified, they weren't naive. But who is experienced? Who is greeted as the recipient of God's grace here? Mary. Mary is the recipient of God's grace. Mary is the special object of God's favor. Clearly, Mary's going to like, uh, why? I barely lived. What have I done that I might deserve God's grace and his favor? How could she? But Luke is telling us, as he's telling us about this first Christmas and what it means that the world is becoming a place where God's special favor gets to unlikely and unqualified people. You see, if you read on through Luke and his sequel, uh, not Luke 2, but Acts Uh, Others throughout then also are described as knowing the grace and favor of God in exactly the same way as Mary. It's like, what is happening here? All of a sudden, God's goodness is grace and favor. It's starting to come, whoever you are, just because that's what God wants us to know from him. Amazing. It's not only that, though. The Lord is with Mary. Might not seem much of a term to us, but to Mary, it is a greeting. She's heard that one before somewhere. 
You know, it, was, it would have been a familiar term in her language and the story of her people at a time when you were defined by your stories. It was the specific way they described someone was with you. The term meant they were like your uh, defending witness who stood at your right hand taking anything that might come your way. Nothing was going to happen to you until it had first happened to the person who was with you. That's what it meant. No, no accusation would ever land on you because unless it got past the person who was with you. Mary, you're never going to be accused of anything with me with you like that. Now, in no way that sticks or stands before me anyway. Perhaps she knew the story of her people where an angel appeared. We can read it in our Old Testament, the early bits of the Bible. An angel appears to Gideon saying exactly the same thing. Gideon, I am with you, Gideon, mighty man of valor. Or maybe the other story that she would have known from her history, fundamental to her people and who she was, where God speaks to Joshua and says, I will be with you in exactly the same ways, saying no one will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Joshua, be strong and courageous. I will be with you, Gideon. I will be with you, Joshua. I will be with you, Mary. I will be with you. That's what the first Christmas is saying, is what God is speaking to Mary and into the world and wanting to speak into us. I will be with you. And if Mary knew the greeting at all, and it's fair to assume she did, she also knew it was fighting talk. Gideon and Joshua's lives were pretty action-packed, knowing that God was with them. Mary was someone who thought about what she was hearing. So I think I can imagine that this young girl might have been troubled by the greeting. Oh yeah, I get why she was being discerning, wondering, um, where exactly is this going? I remember where this went for some other people, my people before now. Because she would have been familiar with it. You see, we all discern the things that we are most familiar with. Personally, and I, and I just need to say at this point, I'm not claiming to be an expert here, but in my life, I've made an effort to be familiar, uh, you know, with all the possibilities uh, so that I could discern a good cheese in my life. It's just, it's just something, you know, I've, I've decided to put some time into. I hope I could discern a good cheese when I taste one. I've tried by thinking about it and being familiar with it, right? In any event, I enjoy trying to discern a good cheese. But I want us to ask a more serious question. Do we see ourselves discerning in any matters, however important or seemingly unimportant they might be in our lives? Years ago, I had a uh, slightly eccentric, I guess, friend who liked to introduce himself as an analytical television viewer. I guess that was the way that he wanted to be discerning and to be known to be discerning. These days, I think instead of thinking about what we're watching on TV, some of us watch other people watching it to see if they're thinking anything about it at all and make whole of other programs about watching other people watching it. I wonder what we're trying to discern in our lives, in our stories, in the things that we see and hear in the rush towards Christmas. I wonder who's thinking about what they're hearing like Mary was thinking about what she was hearing. I, I assume Mary was familiar with the greeting because Luke is telling us she needed to she recognize it in some way she needed to think about. I expect she would have been familiar with God's story in any way that she knew it and was looking out for it in her life. Because that better placed her to be able to discern her place in God's story and make the most sense of her life. Because when any of us are familiar with God's story, remembering his promises, we too are more likely 
to discern, to understand, to recognize, to find faith and a peace for the life that God has called us to live. I don't know whether you've tried to discern much of your life in terms of God's story. If you haven't, Alpha is a fantastic place to begin. Look out for Alpha. You can find out about it on our website. We run it regularly to help people discern maybe where God is and what he might be saying to them. I think anything that we do to help each other remember God's big story will help others discern better. Sometimes we just wonder whether we're going to be comfortable or whether it's what we're expecting or whether it's what we like. And we can get ourselves very confused in life in that. Mary was looking to see how it fitted in God's story, how that made most sense. And that made her most ready for remarkable things that God was going to do in her life. What a great example of what might leave us most ready for what God is going to do. And we see that in Mary's second response in verse 38. She replies to Gabriel, let it be to me according to your word. Mary was looking to build a life with Joseph in which they each bring their hopes and dreams, their own ideas and preferences. Will our home be like Mary wants it or Joseph wants it? Or, well, how will it settle? How... Well, things work out. Whatever we may, home we may make and family we may have. Who could blame her if she was really focused on her own plans in those days approaching her own wedding day? Of all the moments you might not actually want to submit to somebody else's plans in your life, has any bride ever wanted someone else to just sweep everything aside? just before their wedding day. But the angel basically comes and says, Stop! Stop, Mary! Put your life down! Mary's good plans were interrupted by God's greater ones. What on earth would have gone through her mind at that? Will I be okay? Will Joseph still want me? Will my family ever, ever believe me? Will the whole village reject me? Couldn't anybody else do this? Wouldn't someone else be better at this? What will it be like? Mary, did she know? (laughs) She didn't. It appears she has no specific answers to these, I think, perfectly reasonable and likely kind of questions. She had nothing in the way of an answer to any of that before she makes this response, this remarkable response of submitting. More than that, it's striking. She doesn't even, whilst I could understand why she would have those questions, she doesn't seem to need answers to those questions before submitting. Her example so challenges and encourages us in the kind of lives that we might live or hope to live before God. Anybody here 12 or 13 today? There may have been some in the room. Anybody have a 12 or 13 year old in their home (laughs) and seen them try and make up their mind about stuff? Anyone here ever been 12 or 13 and a little bit unsure who they were and what life was going to be? Maybe. Did you feel grown up and ready to make life-altering decisions? No. Recognizing and responding to God's values always includes some measure of submitting to his initiative in which his grace and his presence are enough. In fact, it's all we have. Your example of submitting to him can challenge and encourage others too in the way that Mary speaks to us still today. What a blessed woman she was to respond in that way. How blessed anybody is 
who might know God and know his grace and be ready to respond to him in anything like that sort of way. And so we come to the third. All, I think all my best sermons have got three points. I don't know where this one ranks, but this is my third one and it's the last one. Okay. In verses 46 to 55, Mary had visited her respectable cousin Elizabeth. Did, what did they say? Did they compare angel stories? Would have been tempting, wouldn't it? Did they try figuring out how God could possibly come good on all his latest and greatest words? No, surely this isn't going to work out well, they could have thought. No. What we hear is that Mary celebrated God. Mary's third response that I want to highlight was just out and out celebration of God's greatness. He will be great. It's going to be great in Mary's eyes, great in her life. She was, Luke 1, 47, rejoicing in God her Saviour. She was remembering his mercy. That's faithfulness from generation to generation. Not just faithful, God's generally faithful across time, but from generation to generation. In life after life after life after life after life, he is faithful. Mary is singing in this incredible song of worship. Make no mistake, Mary didn't simply accept God's word and his ways okay I can't see I've got any other option all right I submit to your words no when we read this through she made a seismically different response to God she celebrated his words I think as my suggestion she was, did that because that's who she was even before Gabriel visited her yep she was grateful for things God had done in her life God things things God had done for her she was grateful to be known by God and be blessed by him she was a highly favored lady but that's not really what she wanted to sing about the main focus was all it said about God, rather than anything about Mary. I think her readiness to discern God's ways and submit to them grew out of her love for God and a life that celebrated his mercy and faithfulness everywhere she saw it. What an important encouragement for us uh, at any time of the year. Christmas is as good a time as any to celebrate that about God any day is it was her joy that her story got woven into God's great and glorious story why wouldn't she submit to that possibility as soon as she discerned it what I get to be a part of this praise God his favor's even come to me he's seen my humble estate I'm now part of God's faithfulness from generation to generation what she wants to sing as we come again to Christmas, as we come again to Christmas, remembering this greatest story, I wonder what we will discern from it. <laughs> you could take it as just another one of them Christmas talks telling us about the, uh, the real meaning of Christmas. I wonder how we will submit. I wonder what we will be ready to celebrate. Those are just amazing ways that Mary speaks to me as I think again on her incredible responses to the angel on that first Christmas. What if I magnified God more like Mary did? What if we all did? What if I had a closer, clearer, stronger, sharper sense that he's my saviour? That he's merciful, that he's mighty, that he's faithful in life after life after life? What if I was clearer 
He's done great things for me, even in the face of my imperfect life, when life doesn't seem entirely good and I can't figure out how his words are going to be fulfilled in my life. But what if I came and worshipped just like Mary? I want to invite us all to do that right now. Let's stand and worship our incredible saviour.